So I'm a computer scientist at heart, and I really love computers. Well, why is that? Since my early days at university, I always considered computers as a think tool. Computers can make us smarter, and they can make us see things that are invisible to us or just not accessible to us through our normal senses. Another thing I discovered during my journey, even starting early days in the university, is that, that I like complex things. I really like, oops, I really like taking things apart and then see whether they break. And if they break, maybe I can reassemble them. And then the biggest thrill is to figure out how these things work. How does this complex system work? And how can I give a simple explanation, maybe through an illustration, how this complex system actually unfolds? So let's take an example from my world. Let's take a red blood cell. Red blood cells roam through our bodies. They go to the lungs, pick up oxygen, deliver it to the trillions of cells in our body. Well, that sounds pretty simple. But as always in biology, there's a catch to that. And the closer you get to it, the more details you reveal, the more interesting and the more exciting it gets and the more complex it gets. So here is an illustration by microbiologist David Goodsell. And he is trying to visualize um, the world of a, of a red blood cell. It's actually a cross-section through a red blood cell, which you see at the bottom. Uh, it's filled with hemoglobin in red. And uh, you see the cell wall in the center, um, populated by these green things, which are receptors. That's how the cell communicates with its environment. And at the top, you have the plasma, which, in which the cell is suspended. So this looks much more complex than the simple cells we saw before. And these kinds of things intrigue me. I'm always thinking about, OK, that's a cool illustration. How can we make it better? So the first step in making this better is to add the third dimension. This is a two-dimensional drawing. It's actually a water coloring. And uh, we can basically add the uh, particles in three dimensions, which you can get from protein databases, and then turn this this two-dimensional drawing into a three-dimensional model. So once you do this and turn it into a model, um, you basically start to um, tell a story. Because how can we convey the dynamics of a system as complex as this one here um, over time and how it unfolds if we're not giving it a narrative? So one way to give it a narrative is, again, to use computers. Computers turn out to be really cool tools and very flexible tools to tell stories. Not only by writing them down, but also by creating story sets. And we know that from animated movies, we're all watching them and we get into adventures. And we also know that from computer games. Computer games make us go on quests and play with adventures and maybe just have plain fun. Now, as it turns out, over the last couple of years, computer tools that help us create these games have become very sophisticated and also publicly available, and especially available to scientists. So we can create really complex worlds and uh, the complex interfaces, basically create scenes like a director, set up the set, set cameras, lights, put actors in, and be in complete control of these worlds. And that sounds somehow an ideal scenario for a scientist, as unusual as it might sound. So let me show you what I mean. Here we start a simulation, a walkthrough, a virtual gallery of body systems, like the skeletal system, muscular system, etc. So you can walk up to any of these systems and say, dive into the lungs, peep a little bit inside, look inside the stomach, or maybe go inside the intestinal system. Oh, and here we have a colony of E. coli bacteria. So we can grab one of these bacteria, go into the inside of this bacterium, see the bristles on the outside, the red stuff is the DNA in the center, lots of things going on, molecule showing the metabolism of the cell. Now we focus on a particular area of the, of the, of the genome. The genome is being read in two stages. One stage is making a copy, and the second stage is having ribosomes creating chains of amino acids, which then magically fold into proteins, which are the basic building blocks of life. You see these in green here. So this is basically the machinery of life, illustrated within a bacterium. 
Let's go back out, a couple of scales up. Back to the bacterium, back into the intestinal system. Let's look at a different system, say the cardiovascular system. Let's dive inside the heart and follow a red blood cell through the heart. So we're following it here, we are diving onto an exploration platform. Here we are in the right atrium of the heart. We can walk up to any of these telescopes and then look at different parts within the heart. Tricuspid valve, um, superior vena cava, whatever we're, we're just looking at. And we get some information about it. We can also walk up to a terminal and watch a movie about, say, heart disease. So this becomes an educational experience that shows the science of heart anatomy. Let's go back out. Let's explore the brain. Let's go inside the brain. We are, we are passing the frontal lobes. We're going inside the brain, looking at the neural network structure, the electrical signals, how the, how the neurons communicate, where they actually get together. We get into the synaptic cleft. Inside the synaptic cleft, chemical signals get promoted from one neuron to the other. This is a level where we can explain how aspirin actually takes away your, your headache. So let's go back out. Back up into the nervous system. Now we go into the brain structure, which we've populated by walkways. So now we're in sort of a giant walk-through brain, which gives us the idea of if you walk through a brain, where are the different anatomical structures? Right now we're walking up to the uh, visual cortex, which helps us process information through our eyes and motion. Finally, let's dive inside the skin. Just go under the skin. Look at one of our trillion cells. Cells are filled with all kinds of organelles. They have structure. They have, they have a, a nucleus. There is DNA being expressed. We have lots of met metabolism going on. We look, can look at some of these structures very closely. We can look at the architecture, the skeleton of a cell, which is called microtubules, and they assemble just in time, and they also at the same time disassemble. This is what we see here. So, Going out from the cell, we are back into the body gallery. So this, in the last three minutes, we went through uh, many org orders of magnitude from a micrometer scale of a bacterium to the meter scale of a human body. And what I didn't tell you before is that what you've seen are not just illustrations, they're actually live models, simulations, if you will. And we can go into any of these places by just navigating the camera to this place and then observe the physiological, physiological uh, processes in this uh, location. This is all possible using game engines, which is quite amazing. And for, for us scientists, this opens up really, really new ways of interacting and building models that are not only engaging, but also entertaining and, and really help to retain and understand the processes we try to illustrate. Another thing that comes with game engines is they've always been associated with very interesting visuals and the latest in display technology. So here's an example. In the background, we see the screen of our virtual gallery we just went through. Marcus is just putting on a set of augmented reality glasses and um, he's going to interact in space. He's going to make some funny movements. When we look at him, he seems to grab something with his hands and then release it. What he actually sees through the glasses is this. We can continue the, the virtual gallery into the real space and he can place the muscle man right inside the room and then scale it up and it's right beside here. So we can make a connection between a virtual space and turn it and really bring it out into the real space and connect the two worlds basically. This opens up tremendous opportunities both for education but also for scientific visualization and understanding. So what, we, what I've shown you is basically the idea of building what we call body universes. Uh, the idea that we can go into a bacterium, uh, look at it as a, as a separate universe, we can go up all the way to a cell, to tissues, to organs, to systems, to whole body systems. 
And now with game technology, we can, com we can combine all of these into different universes. We call them body galaxies because you can basically go from one universe to the other and they are all on separate scales, both in time and space because a bacterium is much smaller than, than say, an organ and uh, reactions on a bacterial scale inside a cell happen much more quickly than, say, how an infection spreads across the body. So the idea of body universes for body galaxies is um, um, what we call multi-scale body universes. And it's actually not unlike the idea of uh, Google Earth for the human body. When you have Google Earth, it's, uh, we have satellite imagery, and we have street view from the camera cars, and we have map data, and we combine that all so that we can basically zoom from outer space onto a single street corner. This is only possible because we have all these images. Now, if we wanted to build this for the human body, we don't have any of these images, or very few of these images. So one way of, of creating these images is to basically create virtual worlds and where we, where we know certain structures that are available on protein databases, for example, and then we can assemble these bigger systems um, by, by building artificial systems. And these artificial systems, as you see in the back here, we're actually back at the red blood cell. This is the illustration that I showed you over the poster from David Goodsell, but now it's a live animated uh, movie, and all the hemoglobins are uh, created just in time as we are flying through this red blood cell. So we've created this universe of a red blood cell from all its con constituents and being assembled in real time just in any, any computer game. So this opens up really, really new avenues also for, for virtual experiments. If we look, when we look at virtual experiments, imagine that we could now do um, pharmaceutical testing just before the clinical trials. Imagine what cost savings that, that uh, entails, and also what opportunities there are to, to really try out a lot, a lot of different virtual experiments before you really uh, do them in, in the real world. Another opportunity is to use um, evolutionary engines in the sense of uh, evolutionary computing. There's a technique in machine learning called evolutionary computing where we can use um, the principles of nature, of evolution, uh, to design and come up with lots of designs at, this, at the same time by, by creating millions and millions of, of experiments at the same time. And this is what, the way how nature creates its designs, tests them, selects them. We can use the same principle now in these virtual worlds to select our experiments and basically to, uh, optimize them towards specific goals and the goals could be diagnostic purposes. So when you look at um, how, we, how we came about to uh, use game engines, this is what I mean when I say we can use the computer as a think tool, because, because now computers have augmented our ability to really do not only scientific exploration, but also illustration, and finally also do these virtual experiments. So, when you now uh, play computer games, I would say you're helping science. Because the more you play these games, the faster the graphics cards get, the better the tools become that we scientists can use. So if your kids like computer games, just let them play these games. They really help us. And if you happen to be a scientist, then I would say start your engines, game engines that is. Thank you very much. <laughs>